students did all the building. Uh, what, and we want to keep the students safe, and if there are things that might not be safe, you know, then we need some help or whatever there. But as much as possible, we want the students to do the building. I, I told Paul yesterday over stories. I won't go into stories now, but I've had so many stories over the years, especially with cars, like mousetrap cars and electric cars and things like that, where the parent would get so involved with the car that the parent would kind of build a car. I actually had one almost doing a competition, and the, the, the student was going to do, set it up, and the parents, don't touch that. You know, William Hardy let him touch it until it was time to do it. And then, fortunately, it broke. Why is that fortunate? Because the dad had this thing ready to go, but it broke, and the kid didn't know how to fix it. So you see what happened there. didn't do the child any good. It was really an awful situation. It was a great device, but the student didn't know how to do it. So I want you to know how to fix it, because this is like, I don't know if you all heard, have ever heard of Murphy's Law. Students, have you heard of Murphy's Law before? It's like if you, Murphy's Law is kind of like if you have a piece of toast with jelly on one side and you drop it on the floor. Let's assume it's a clean floor, okay? And you drop it on the floor. It says, you know, statistics say that 50% of the time it's going to land, the jelly side is going to land down on the floor and 50% of the time it's going to land up. But we know that when you drop that almost all the time, the jelly side is going to hit on the floor. You know, it defies that statistical logic. And so if something's going to go wrong in your machine, it's going to go wrong. It's like in the old days, those of you, you look pretty young parents, but when they had people who would come to your house to fix your television, there were people who used to do that. They would come to a house to fix it. The TV's on the blink. It's on the blink. Well, when they come to the house, it's working perfectly. You know, that kind of thing. So what happens is you might get your device this year ready. I'm warning you now because this is going to happen. You might do it at school. It's perfect at school. We're going to load it up today and now take it to the competition. And something that's never gone wrong before will go wrong that day. So you need to know how to fix it. And those are the students who do very well. It's the ones who know their device. They know how it works and why it works. And they, they can improvise and fix it. Okay? So that's what we're going to be doing today. You're going to be building as much as possible. Okay? I'm going to go through some slides in just a minute. And the slides would kind of set the stage for what the event's like this year. And then we're going to look at the score sheet, but only briefly. But that, that score sheet's pretty important. It might not be the score sheet that they use at the tournament you go to. They might use the national. We have a national score sheet. But this event is slightly different if you're at a regional tournament versus a state tournament versus the national tournament. So let's don't put the cart before the horse. We won't worry about the national and state too much right now. Well, I'll tell you how they're different, and the main difference is the time. Everybody's time today, and we'll I'm going to talk about time at the end. I don't want to focus on the time too much, but the device you make, the ideal thing is for you to start it and it to end 60 seconds later. And at the state, there's a longer time, and at the national, there's a longer time. And they don't tell you the time until you get there. Do you know the range of time, like 60 to 90 seconds, 90 to 120 seconds? But you don't know it until you get there. And you have to be able to adjust your machine, your device, to take longer so it can do the ideal time. But let's not worry about that. That's being presumptuous, you know, thinking we're going to go to the state and national. You want to have high hopes, but let's worry about the regional today. I'm going to show you a regional score sheet. And the reason I'm showing you that is I have teams that show up. I do regional tournaments. I do state tournaments. And I do the national tournament. I actually have some coming to a national tournament that don't know the rules. And you're wondering, how do they make it to the national tournament without knowing the rules? Well, some states don't run all the events. And what they do in that particular state, they might not run this event. Or they might pick three or four, because this event takes a lot of volunteers to actually run the event. So they might not run it. So the state champions from Wyoming might never have done this event before. Now, parents, that's why in Chicago one year in high school, they had these simple machines. They didn't have simple machines. They had transfers. So they had light energy, chemical energy, heat energy. And one kid from like Wyoming, Montana, who'd never run their device before. I'm looking at the device, and they have this milkshake cup, white milkshake cup full of black powder. And it's got a string that goes across the top. And the idea was to burn the string in half. I said, what's that black powder? He said, that's gunpowder. He had two pounds of gunpowder. And I said, and it had little match heads, the old-fashioned kitchen match heads in the gunpowder. I said, why are you got those match heads? He said, so it'll ignite. I said, oh, it's going to ignite. I said, have you ever practiced and tested this before? I knew he had. I knew the answer because he wouldn't be there if he had. 
He said, no, I've never practiced, but I want to be sure to burn that string in half. I said, well, you're going to burn the ceiling in half and all these other devices and stuff. So we had to take the gunpowder away. So he'd never done it. It was not very safe. So we're going to be safe. I'm going to talk a little bit about safety today. But that's how you can have one showing up not knowing the rules. But this can happen to you, not the gunpowder. But you might show up at a regional tournament ready to run your device, and you've broken some very important rule. Now, I hate it when that happens because you're going to be dashed because it's like you can't even compete sometimes. Some events won't let you compete if you break certain rules. Or this one, if you break certain rules, you're going to be so poor, so low, you're, everybody's going to beat you, and you're going to feel sad about that. So I use that score sheet to, as a checklist for you to go through. Not Don't wait till you get to the tournament. You go through it and make sure you've met all the different rules. That way when you get there, you qualify. And automatically, a team that brings a device in that meets all the rules will beat every any other teams that don't meet all the rules. And at a regional tournament, I've been sorry, got to go in there. I've got some regional tournament sometimes where I've been to some where there are like 10 or 10 teams that don't meet the rules. And so anybody who meets all the rules beats 10 teams. But it's sad when you don't follow the rules. So that check sheet, you're going to get a copy today. Use that to make sure you met all the rules. Okay? So I'll come back to that. And then after that, what we're going to do is I'll give just a few coaching tips. We'll talk about safety. And then we're going to start building. And we're going to build almost all day. And then near the end at some point, we're going to stop building and we're going to test the devices. We'll be testing them a little bit along the way, but we're going to try to officially test each one, see how it did, and talk about how it would have scored, okay, if, you, if it had really been real today. And today, everything might not work perfectly. Don't worry if it doesn't. But we'll see if it did, if this happened and this happened, what would the score be? But then what really happened today? And then at the very end, I'm going to talk a little bit about my construction philosophy. You probably already know that by the end of the day. Um, and then... Some, hopefully some very important coaching tips at the very end. Paul tells me that you're going to be able to get all the slides. So don't worry about trying to take notes and stuff like that. There might be some things you want to jot down. But Paul's going to make sure you have access to all to the agenda and all the slides. Now, I have to tell you, the agenda, the building part, is kind of in order the way I work with teams. If, you were, if I were your teacher and you were in my classroom, this is the order I would go in. And this is an event we would do after school. We probably would not do this a lot in class. There are other events we would do in class because I have so much other stuff I've got to teach. But after school, we'd be doing it this way. And what I would not do, I don't know if your school does this, parents, I would not pick two or three students to do Mission Possible and two or three to do this event, Electric Glider, and two or three to do this event and whatever. I wouldn't do that. Some schools do that. But that way, the only school the students who experience this event and enjoy it are the two or three you've chosen to be in it. And it's nice if you're in it. But there are lots of students that you go to school with, students, that would really love to do this. So I'd, I'd like to have a bunch of them build at my school, in my class. So I'd have teams all over the place. It might Maybe this many students would be building at least after school. And then when we get near, later in the school year, we would pick maybe one of the devices that does better than the others. We'd have another device that would be a second place. It's the backup team. But they would be the one that would be competing. And then really, what usually this is beautiful when this happens, all the other teams who have built... Let's suppose yours is the best one that we've had and the rest of them don't score quite as good. All the other students tear theirs apart and loan pieces of their device to this team to, to make it even better. So it's really a whole group contribution at the end. And the team who goes is kind of representing everybody. And so that's the way I like to see it happen. So I'm going to talk about that at the end. Okay? So with that, that's it. Anybody, parents got questions? You know where bathrooms are? Did you tell people bathrooms and stuff when they came? Just to your right. They're both um and students, for today, you can ask your parents if you want to, but you don't have to ask me if you've got to go to the bathroom. There are no hall passes today. Okay, no detention halls or anything like that today. Okay, and the only time I might shout today is if I see somebody about to do something dangerous. I might have to, with my elementary students, if I say freeze, everybody stops what they're doing because it was important to stop everybody because I got to see somebody about to get in trouble over there. Okay, all right. So let's do, you want to start the slides? Yeah, sure. thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll go any questions? Anytime, put your hand up if you've got questions. Students, be sure. To, it's okay to ask questions anytime. I had a teacher one time who always said that the, the only dumb question, the only thing, dumb thing to do is not to ask a question. Okay? All right, so here we are. Mission Possible. Hope you're in the right room. And this year we're going to start with... And by the way, this part is going to be the only part, what I've already been doing, this is the only part like school. Teachers stand up talking to all of you. But after a while we're going to be building. 
All right, that's all you got to do this year to start. Let me go back a little bit. All you got to do is drop a racquetball into the device. That's how you start it. And you're going to, if here's a device, I'll pretend this is the device. If I'm dropping a racquetball, I'm going to drop it from up here somewhere above the device. I can't reach in here and drop it. I've got to drop it from up here. So today, you're going to be starting the device by just dropping a racquetball. Don't, never fear if you don't have a racquetball. We've got some extra ones we can loan you today. And some of you got them. You might want to loan one. I think it's great when we're at a competition and some teams comes that don't have a racquetball and other teams, here, use our, you can use our racquetball. It's nice when they are sport, good sports like that. I see that happen all the time. And that's great. But we do have some. Most of the supplies that we brought today that you can use are back there back on the back bench. There's going to be one box of stuff I'll remind you later that is uh, Mr. Voinoff's box. I don't want to give that stuff away. But other stuff we can give away if you need it today. But the, the pulleys and stuff, we're not going to let those go. Or we're not going to give away all these tools. But if we need to use tools, the tools are over here. Now, parents, if your student's going to use a tool that they have never used before, it's okay to show them how to use that tool. If you want me to come over and show you how to use the tool, I'm fine with that, okay? In fact, in my classes, I don't let anybody do any sawing until I've shown them how to saw, and they've sawed in front of me so that I know they saw safely, and they do that all the time. Now, one thing we don't have today, which we'll probably be okay with the tools we have, is we don't have goggles for everybody, you know, but, um, and I think we're okay, but if you start putting a nail in something today, like you've got a nail, and you're going to put a nail in it, you, somebody needs to be wearing goggles. The people around you do, because usually it's not necessarily the person who hits it, it's the person standing over here gets hit in the eye with a nail. Okay, so if we or start hammering nails, we're going to have to wear goggles. But I don't think we've got nails to hammer. So most of the stuff we're using today is soft stuff and cardboard and little saws and stuff. Okay? All right. So start it with a ball falling into the device. Now, this year, you're going to be using these types of machines. Um, I'm going to assume, so you won't feel nervous, some of you, that I'm going to assume some of you don't know what these are. I have to tell you, I have a lot of teachers I work with. I was a science coordinator in a large school district. In my school district, we had 138,000 kids just in my district that I worked with science in. And so that's just one district. And now it's 163,000 kids or something like this. The fastest growing one. I'm in the middle of North Carolina. But I had teachers that taught for me that didn't know what these were. And so the teachers didn't know. And it's okay if you don't know, if you have, don't know these things. But we're going to show you some of these today. I got some slides of a couple of these. You'll see real ones out there, the stuff you're building. But the idea in your machine that you're going to build is to use these machine types. And some of them have restrictions on them. And I'll go through the restrictions today. Uh, so levers, you've seen a lever before, like a seesaw. A seesaw is a good example of a lever, and I'm not going to spend a long time on it. When I do this with students, my students, I teach these things in class. How many of you and students have learned about levers in class? Okay, some have, some haven't. Uh, that's good. I, have. I go to a lot of classes where they never learn about a lever in class. This is your simplest lever. We won't worry about the classes right now, but there's, there are three classes of levers, and this is the simplest one, class one, that's like a seesaw. You have a lever that's like a wheelbarrow, you know, where you have the, the fulcrum, or the, where it pivots is on the end where the wheel is, and you pick it up like this, and the load's in the middle, and a, a simple wheelbarrow is a type of um, lever, and it's very handy for doing things like this, using a whole barrel. And really the hardest one to use, the one that's kind of like our arm, or, or, or a broom, if I'm holding the top of the broom, it's like the fulcrum, and I'm, I'm putting my efforts way up here, and the force is the broom against the floor, or in this case, like a fishing pole. To me, you know, there's a use for these kind of levers. These are the third class ones, but they're not the ones that are most efficient, usually. All right, pulleys, you've seen pulleys before where that's a simple pulley with a string that goes over it, and you pull the string down, and the, and the weight goes up. I have to tell you, how many of you have learned pulleys in school? Do you have pulleys in school? Okay, good. Most of my students use pulleys. I learned pulleys myself, not in school, but in a fishing village. I grew up in a fishing village, and we were using all kinds of pulleys to lift nets and our catch and things like that all the time. And uh, people that sail use a lot of pulleys. But this is a simple pulley. My students are always uh, are surprised that if that box is 100 pounds, I'm going to have to pull 100 pounds worth to pick it up. Not the best picture there, but... Um, and then we're going to have some pulleys that look like this. Okay, that we're going to use. We've got some back there. Some, by the way, the pulleys stay here, so don't take one off with the pulleys. Here's a simple incline plane. It's like a ramp. Like at a school, like if I wanted to get 
at, if there's a ramp, I wanted to get something to the top of the ramp. I could back a truck up that was level with the ramp. That'd be great. I could push things out on with a wheel truck. Or if I had these big barrels and they're on the ground, I got to roll them up the ramp or get them up somehow. So I pull them up the ramp. Now that's an inclined plane. But unfortunately, this year you can use an inclined plane, but for it to count, you got to push or pull something up it. You can't just let something roll down an inclined plane, which you can, but it won't count. Okay, so something sliding down an inclined plane or rolling down will not count as an inclined plane. It only counts if something goes up it. And for it to count, it has to move at least 10 centimeters along the plane. They really, originally, Paul, they wanted that to be 10 centimeters vertically, but we're, the rule is, parents, uh, that as long as it moves 10 centimeters up along the plane, it's okay. All right. Oh, wrong one. The screw is one of the harder ones to use. You see pictures of screws at the top. We have some here. But most teams use something like a threaded rod, which counts. It has screw threads on it. And you've got some there. We've got some over there. We might cut those. I, we do have a hand hacksaw if you need to cut those. and use a. You don't have to use the whole long threaded rod. You might use a shorter one. But a piece of threaded rod with those wing nuts on it, we can make a screw that works. And one of the restrictions on the screw this year is that it has to turn at least a full turn, which that's not much of a restriction. That's pretty easy. What would be worse is if it had to turn many turns and the nut had to move a certain distance. That would be tougher. We're not doing that this year. Might do it next year. A wedge. You see an example there of a wedge at an airport where they've got a wheel, something chalk or something under the tires so the airplane doesn't just roll off. Um, that's a wedge. Scissors kind of are like two wedges that are used to slice something. Um, the only problem is a wedge only counts if you, like the scissors do count, or a wedge that's pushed between two things that separates them, that counts. But pulling a wedge out of something and then letting it fall will not count. I mean, that's a wedge. But the rules say, they're going, the restrictions are the wedge has to be pushed in so that it separates two things. And I'll show you some examples. You've got lots of stuff. You, we made some wedges. We've got some wood ones back there we'll give you. If you'd like to have one of those today, you can use one of those in your device. Okay. Wheel and axle is one of the harder ones to understand sometimes. What it is not is like a matchbox car. You, know, you might call that an axle that's under there, and that's a wheel that turns. But that wheel and axle do not turn together. They turn, the wheel just spins freely on what you call the axle. So that's not truly a wheel and axle. A true wheel and axle is kind of like a screwdriver. If I've got a screwdriver and I'm turning it, you know, I, it's like I'm grabbing the, the handles like the wheel and the shaft of the screwdriver that's going to turn the screw is the axle, and they both turn at the same time. And the fact that the handle's bigger than the axle gives me a little advantage. I don't have to turn as hard to, to turn the screw. So that's kind of like the two pictures above. You can see both of them are... So we're, a wheel and axle that works nicely in the machine is like a little dowel rod with a spool on it, and you see it's got string on both pieces, so that when you pull one piece of string, it makes the other one wind up and lift something. Now, the good news is, on a wheel and axle, I believe it lets you either lower something or raise something, either way. So it's not quite as restricted. But just a car rolling... Now, I have some that have a car that rolls down an inclined plane. That has two problems. The car doesn't count as a wheel and axle, and inclined plane doesn't count because it's going down. But they show up at tournaments and want to count that, and I have to explain why it doesn't count. Okay, this year, there's no electrical. And it's funny, I hate to say this, I know none of you would do this, but I get all these questions from all the teams all over the country. Every time there's a question that comes asked to the national website, I have them all the time. Here's a question I'm going to get asked a lot this year. The rules say we can't use any electricity, but is it okay if I use just a little bit? And I feel like saying, being facetious, say, oh, just for you. Nobody else in the country can use it except you. But uh, no, the answer is no. We just say no on that one. So you can't use and, and they'll forget. They'll, they'll have a flashlight or something. They turn on to do something. And they, well, it's not doing much. Well, it's got electrical. It's using electrical, so you can't use it. So no electrical. You say no motors that are electric motors, no. Now, wind-up motors are okay. And that's a good clue. That's a good tip. Wind-up motors are okay. So remind me later today, I'm sorry y'all won't be here at the end, but remind me near the end today, come back to wind up motors, why they're so good, okay? But not electrical ones. None of that electrical stuff you can use. All right. Actually, I'll go back. Uh, it says no electrical components, so you don't want, I wouldn't even use any. Even though you're not using electrical, I wouldn't even use any components. All right. Candles. 
It does allow you to use three candles, but but I'll tell the group, it doesn't give you any points for using candles. You don't get any points for using a candle. So if you were going to burn a string in half, Versus if you can cut it with a pair of scissors, not you, the device. Something falls on the handle of the scissors, makes the scissors do this, and cuts the string in two. What are you going to do? Yeah, what are you going to do? No. Well, yeah, yeah, they take longer in time. I haven't taught how those points count. It does. You get more points for it taking 60 seconds. You get two points per second. That's 120 points. So, yes, but the rules also say no fuses. So if you've got a candle burning and you burn a piece and it's burning like a fuse, that won't count. We have to make you take that out of the device. But a candle with a string waiting to burn, waiting to burn, it's using time. It's using time. So you're right. For every second that goes on, you get two points. So that's good. But when the scissors cut the string, that's 25 points. So I would cut the string. And two reasons for not using candles, I can tell you, but this happens every year, year if I use candles. And most, many schools now don't even allow candles to be used in the classroom. It's forbidden. But I might have a candle on a table we're going to use later, and it's lit. Somebody's going to lean over and do something. And if you've got long hair, you can set your hair on fire real fast with a candle. So candles can be very dangerous. Just, yeah, like long hair would be very bad to set your hair, one side of your head burned off there because you leaned over. Students do it all the time. I, they lean over and they'll burn a part of their body or something will get burned leaning over. So be careful. I would suggest don't bother with them. They are good timing devices. I'm going to talk about timing later. But there are safer ones that you could use for timing, okay? All right. So they're possible. But doing this on the right, that's a fuse. If this candle burns and then this material burns over to the other candle, that's a fuse. This wouldn't be allowed. It had to be removed. Simple candle. You can use up to three candles. A simple candle is allowed, but not a fuse, and that's a fuse. Not to mention the first year we had fuses, the very first one had a fuse, and it went off and set off the smoke detector. We had to evacuate the school for two hours. That, that had a city, they had a county ordinance in that county that if you had a fire alarm went off at a school, you couldn't go back into the school until every room in the school had been checked to make sure there was no fire. So we'd wait for the fire department to get there, and here it was February, and they're all standing outside for two hours because of that fuse. So we're not real high on fuses. Okay, some, you, got, you can have some chemical reactions that go on in your device. They take time. A good safe one is the one on the upper right. We have stuff here for you today like vinegar and baking soda and balloons. So if you want to play with that one today, you can do that. I'll show you later timing devices you can do with balloons and they can be chemical or not. They don't have to be. But you can use different chemical reactions as long as they're contained and safe. All right. This is one of the harder things to catch. And maybe I should have waited until later to tell you this one. But no dead-end paths. Now, here's an example. Let's say your device, everything's in working. This thing makes that happen, makes that happen, makes that happen. But then all of a sudden, you want to do this other kind of machine, so you have this make that machine happen over there. But then that machine doesn't cause anything else to happen. That's a dead-end path. Those are not allowed. They're hard to catch sometimes, but no, no dead-end paths because they're going to say... You, no points. And you go, what? I did all this work. No points. Now, the, end, the simple way to end it is with a bell. And I saw bells already. I saw a really nice bell back there. Um, and what's funny, one year we had a bell at high school. And I, it's like that Wyoming kid again. Well, I hate to say Wyoming. Probably, I don't know what, Nevada, we'll say. But we were checking the device. And we said, now, where does it start? Right here. And where is it, where's your bell? And the kid goes, do we have to have a bell? Here he is at National. Didn't know we had to have a bell. Okay, but that's a simple bell, and so you could have something hit the bell, or you could have that those scissors cut the string, and the bell falls not on the floor, but in the bottom of the device. And you can set your stuff down for now, and we'll get you situated in a minute, okay? Okay? All right, so then we stop the clocks when we hear the bell. Or it could be this kind of bell, like the old hotel bell. I kind of like this kind. Uh, but something just falls on the bell at the end, and we stop the clocks. Okay, so when the bell rings, now I have had devices before where all this stuff's happening and then something fell on the bell right in the middle. We stopped the clocks. So there's a lot of stuff that didn't count. So make sure when you make your device that that's going to truly be the end. And it always happens. In other words, there, th this is, this, you might want to remember this, parents. And, and we are not allowed to let the student touch the device so that the student completes the last task. 
I cannot tell you how, Murphy's Law, I can't tell you how many devices do everything they're supposed to do and they get right there and the last thing doesn't work. The last thing is supposed to fall over, something's supposed to hit it and make it fall on the bell. That, nothing, the thing before it falls short doesn't hit it. So it falls short over here and the thing's just standing there. Clocks are running. By the way, you gain points for each second up to 60 seconds. But when your device takes longer than 60 seconds, we start subtracting a point per second. And we're allowed to let it run another 120 seconds. So those 120 points they just made now get erased because we're standing there and the bell's not ringing. So the kids want to touch, they want to touch that. Can I knock that over? Can I knock that over? No. You can knock it over and we stop and, everything, and we're going to lose all your time points as if it didn't get knocked over. And we're not going to give you task completion because the rules say you cannot do anything to cause that last task to happen. There's a rule in there that says that. So I want to point that out. That's a very important rule because I cannot tell you how many times they stop right there at the end. And the kids say, can I cut a string to drop it on there? No. Can, you, can I knock it over? No. So it's agony. We have to stand there for another two minutes waiting for something that's not going to happen. And then they lose all their points. And so that will happen to somebody. I hope it doesn't happen to any of you this year, okay? All right, so that's, how, that's it. That's, how, that's all there is to it. So, but I want you to consider this. A lot of teams are overwhelmed by this event. That's why you're going to see the way I do it today. I don't think it's quite as overwhelming. We're, I'm going to give it to you in pieces. We're going to do little parts at a time. If I gave you the rules, to, here, here are the rules, go build it. Most teams go, this is overwhelming. There's just so much. But if you do it in pieces, it's not so bad. So we're going to try to do that this year. But I want you to consider this. Here's a team that shows up, and the rules say that if you show up, and you have, you have to make a list of what your machine is going to do. It's called... A, it's action sequence list. You have to make a list. It tells you how to do that in the rules. And you do that. And you have it ready. It's on time. And it's just as described in the rules. You get 25 points. There are like four requirements that go with it. So that's 100 points just for you making your list. And it's accurate. You have 30 minutes to set your device up when you get to the competition. So once you set it on a table and they say, okay, you're ready to compete, set it on a table, start setting it up. You have 30 minutes. You can take longer. You can take, we had one at National one year, it took three hours. He was by himself and it kept breaking. But he finally got it to run. It was really good, but he didn't get those 50 points because he took more than 30 minutes. But he was willing to do that because he was going to get a lot more than 50 running it. But if you set your device up and it's ready to go within 30 minutes, you get 50 points. It stopped. You drop a racquetball from above the device and it starts. 100 points. Let me come back to that smaller one. It uses, let's say it's supposed to run 60 seconds, but it runs at 50. You get two points per second. That's another 100 points. It wasn't ideal. 60 is ideal, but okay. And then in it, you get to use levers and pulleys and stuff, but let's say it only does, you drop the ball, it has a first class lever that tips, and the first class lever does a pulley that makes the bell ring. So you only have two machines in it. 25 points. That's one. Com correct action transfer, and it rings that bell, 250. You've just made 655 points. You're going to beat a lot of people if you get 655 points. So I had one last year where uh, two boys showed up. They were high school, but they showed up with junk. In other words, they decided they weren't going to do it, and on the bus or before school, or before they came that day, they grabbed a bunch of stuff, and they were just going to drop a ball on a bell. I mean, that, that, it didn't have a ball last year. It didn't have a bell, but that's what it would be equivalent to, dropping a ball on a bell. And I said, how, you know, that's kind of embarrassing. You drop, and it would be no time. And I said, why don't you get it to do this and this and this? And before it's over, they got five or 600 points. In their 30 minutes, they built it. They built it during the 30 minute setup time. So you should at least all strive to get at least 655 points, or at least 625 points. The, the 30 points there for smaller, there is a reward this year. It tells you the size of the device. That's the maximum size. Uh, can I use yours for an example for a minute? Yeah. yeah. It's okay to just pick it up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a little All right. Let me just pick it up for a second and carry it to the front. All right. And you, I'm going to make you read the rules. I'm not going to read them to you, but I'll tell you some as we go by today. Let's pretend now that this device was exactly the maximum height. Middle school students, I hate to tell you middle school students, but this happens lots of times. So I'm not trying to embarrass you, but if the rules say the maximum height is... I'll pick, say, one meter, 
and or 60, let's say 60 centimeters. The maximum height is 60 centimeters and the width is 60 centimeters and the depth is 60 centimeters. They have a tendency to want to build a box that's 60 by 60 by 60. I do see a couple, some of your squirming around. There are a couple I see immediately that look like they might be. Is that 60 by 60 by 60? Yes. And that one's 60 by 60 by 60. And they want to do that. And that's okay. There's a rule this year, though, that says used to be if it was longer than 60, they were in a whole different group. It's called a tier. That means they were in the second place group. Everybody who had it smaller than 60 by 60 by 60 beat them, which is almost everybody. And I, sure enough, I'd get there, and it would be 60.1, one of the dimensions. They didn't cut it right. Somewhere, or they have a screw sticking out the back, and they'd already used their 60, but they need that screw or that bolt. And that bolt, this bolt looks like it's at least 3 centimeters long, so this one will be 63 if this were already 60. They don't think about stuff on the back. Like you have bolts. If yours is exactly 60 by 60 by 60, if it were... This bolt right here makes it bigger than 60 by 60 by 60. Because I have to measure from the far side of this bolt to the far side of that bolt. So it's two bolt head thicknesses bigger than 60 by 60. There's a penalty for that. So make it smaller than 60 by 60 by 60. We measure it, and this year there's a reward that if it's smaller than 60 by 60 by 60, they get points, and they get a point per centimeter. And I'm assuming that you made it 50 by 50 by 50. That would be 10 points, 10 points, 10 points. That's 30 points. That's where you get the 30 points. So this year, and don't worry about starting small. I almost hate to tell you this part because if you start trying to make it small from the beginning, it's going to be too, it's, I think it's too challenging. So really, it's okay to start big. And now today, our rules today is, are, if you've already built a box, you can surely use that box. But if you don't have a box, you guys don't have a box right now. But... You can use the whole tabletop today. We're not going to keep restrictions on the 60 by 60 by 60 today. Just for building purposes, I don't want to limit you. So use the whole table. Just don't screw things to the table or nail them to the table. They might not like it here at the school. Or damage the table. You can tape things to the table. And we're going to have hot glue guns today, so don't hot glue the table today, okay? Because it's hard to get it up. We can get it up, but it's, we might scratch the table trying to get the hot glue up. So. Tape things. We've got two kinds of tape today. I don't have any clear tape. It's nice to have some of that. We might get a little bit of it. There might be some at the front here. Yeah, there's a dispenser. I've got a couple of things I use the clear tape for, cellophane tape. But we have masking tape and duct, duct tape today. So you can use those. But don't damage the table. You don't worry about size today. We aren't going to worry about the extra points for being smaller today. I did have some last year at high school that were about this small. And they didn't do everything, but they did enough. But they were small. They got a lot of points. Okay? Now, that shoo, that's it. That's, that's all there is to it, right? I, I do want to talk about safety for just a minute before I turn you, turn you loose. And the coaching tips are, I think students need to be supervised. And I, don't know if your coach, your, I don't know if your teachers did this, students and parents, but I recommend this to mine in, in the district where I was the coordinator. If they had a science Olympiad team, they had to send a letter home and tell the students that they would be build, they'd be building some things such as electric launch gliders, mousetrap cars, and Mission Possible devices, and whatever else they were building. And I asked the parents to talk to their student and make sure if they knew their student was, were, was building these things and how much help they needed. And I, I asked them to please supervise the student if they were using any tools and to really not let them use any power tools. They weren't suppose under 18 years of old, unless they're in a certain class, they shouldn't be really using power tools. Now, they're the parents. If you decide you're going to let them use a power tool, that's up to you. But I don't want a parent telling me, oh, you said they were building this, they could use power tools. <laughs> no, I did not. Um, because I want the students to be safe. Also, I don't want to be sued later in the year by the parents but when the kid got hurt or something, okay? And I don't want you all to get hurt. That's the main thing, that students don't get hurt. So they should send that letter home. But I'm asking the parents that are here is make sure that you do supervise, like today, box cutters. I, if, most schools, if you bring box cutters to school, you're going to be in trouble. They'll suspend you. But when we build after school, we're going to have some in the room. We're going to have some box cutters. Don't put them in your pocket and walk out with them. You can get in trouble somewhere. And these, all the tools are Mr. Voinoff's tools, so don't walk off with them today. But we're going to use box cutters. All the time, I tell teachers, when I do this with teachers, I'm always telling teachers, 
cut away from yourself. I have teachers, they'll be cutting something, they'll have a box cutter, and they're cutting, and they're cutting, and cutting. What happens if it cuts through all of a sudden? I'm going to stab myself. I've seen it happen. <laughs> so cut, if you're going to cut, cut away from yourself and cut, get everything out of the way. Don't be in a hurry. Take your time and let's just and cut. So parents, please supervise cutting with box cutters. And if you cut something on a box cutter on this tabletop, when it goes through the thing, it's going to cut a hole in the tabletop. So put something under it like a piece of wood or cardboard or something like that, but don't cut, you know, don't mess up the tabletop. So we got box cutters. I got little hand saws. Question? We were going to um, stop away to unscrew this cap before okay. saying it's Sure. But we didn't have this screw. Well, let's do this. Let's say when you put this on here, what I would do if I were you is I would put a black mark on here. Yeah, we were thinking mark yeah. it. So yeah, mark it so they could easily see that it turns more than one turn and then falls off. You want to turn more than one turn and then falls off. Then you're good. That will help you also know how, how far to put it on every time. But yeah, if you pull this off and you have something twist that off, you've used a screw. Uh, and then sand's going to fall out like a timer, right? Yeah, because we were just going to tip it, but then... Yeah, yeah, get another right. Transaction. That you get some more time taking it, yeah. You know that? It'll be perfectly dry in the competition because the sand will stick to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and the best way to do is cut... Uh, is, uh, you're going to have it like this anyway, right? Uh, is it going to tip or is it going to start out like that? Okay. I'd cut this off so you can easily add sand to it every time rather than not have to add sand through the mouth. You can put this on and put your line where your sand is because that lets you know where to start every time. Otherwise, if you put too much sand, it's going to take more time. If you put too little sand, it won't take enough time. So what you want to do is make sure you know exactly how long this takes every time. Okay. So make sure you cut the top. And you can use a larger bottle. Yeah. So but just keep in mind, when you fill this full of sand, there's going to be more pressure on this cap. It's going to be harder to turn to take off. Uh, so some would it be better if it was like this? Not necessarily. I just want you to realize it's uh -huh. going to be harder. Because what some students do is they get everything ready to go and they get the sand in it and then it won't, what's happening, but it won't turn it. It won't do it because it's a little pressure on it. So you have to kind of play with that and see if you can get it to work, okay? okay. Putting it on this lever. Show them your idea. Like, okay. This level will be right here. So the then... ball's going to fall on that lever. Now, yeah. what's the ball going to go after it hits that lever? It's going to lift it up, and then this will. That's going to do something, right? Yeah. And let it go again. I'm going to drop the ball on it, okay? Throw it on the way and see where the ball went, right? Yeah, it's going to fall. Make sure that ball doesn't roll out of the device. More. Okay. Yeah, so some people fix it where they put a little something like a little bit of just light cardboard around there, so when that uh, ball falls, the ball stays there. Jesus. That, because there's a penalty if something comes out of the device. Or some people later might put a piece of pantyhose across there or some kind of little something just to keep the ball from rolling out. Because if the ball rolls out of there, they're going to give you a 50-point penalty. Okay. Right. Plus, the ball might do this. The ball might bounce and hit something else and set it off, and you won't get credit for it. Okay. So control that where that ball goes. Okay. All right. There you go. Don't. I'm going to test it. All right. Let's see if it works. Go. Oh. The fuse is a little too strong. Come on. The fuse is too strong. What's supposed to happen? Explain to me what's supposed to happen. So what's supposed to happen is this is supposed to release. It's supposed to be just strong enough so that it can hold this up, but won't. But whenever I do that, it, that happens. Yes. So it has to stay on and keep going, though. That was not nearly enough. It doesn't look like it was nearly enough for the 10 centimeter rule, huh? Yeah. Don't, don't, don't. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so what's going to happen is we're going to drop the ball into this cup and we have a string attached to this side of the cup so the ball is going to break the duct tape that's holding it and it's going to push this down and this will probably pull something in the future. Okay, is this the first test? Yeah. Yep. Um, it pulled something. Okay, what do we think here? Uh, I think uh, maybe it did what it did. Uh, like we need mm. some weight on this side so it doesn't just... Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 I'll be back. You see the mouse trap, how that was got the piece that is orange, the, the yellow orange piece there? You see how big that is? Mm. That's okay. hard to miss. So you got to hit anywhere on that orange? you got to hit that anywhere. Whereas the other piece you have is just that little piece of metal you got to hit. Yeah. That is a whole lot easier to hit. Is that okay? I can get those. Yeah, see, so if you hit that anywhere, it's going to trip. Yeah, so see. 
If I hit that anywhere, I even on the edge right now, it's going to work. So. Okay, so it's going to start there and we're going to drop the ball in. It's going to be caught by this thing so it doesn't go off. It's going to hit the dominoes, which is then going to trigger the pulley releasing the marble. It's going to come down here, through there, and fall on the mouse trap, releasing the mouse trap. Go for it. And it ah, so what do you think happened? Yeah. Wasn't lined up perfectly. Where'd the marble go? To the oh. left, about half a centimeter. Right. So where the one blade and you plug it in. No, I've never seen anybody use a saw that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's very imaginative. Yes. I just pulled this out. So what? What? What's going to happen? You hold one end of this, I hold other. You hold other. Okay, so what's What's going to happen to make this turn? Here's eventually what I thought was right. going to happen. Like this marble will come down, mm -hmm. and it would like hit another marble off this end. Mm -hmm. Like it would hit a marble, and then this, that one would just keep going. But that marble would go in here. Now, if that marble keeps going, does it just stop, or is the marble going to fall into the paddle wheel? Well, the, can the first marble keep going along the track? No, that's a dead end path. If it keeps going and does something else over here, but yet you've got the paddle wheel turning over here, that's a dead end path. You don't want to do that. But if that marble falls in the paddle wheel, it's going to turn the paddle wheel a little, but not much. What do you have to do? What have you ever seen a paddle wheel that makes electricity or, or a grinds up mill? What? Doesn't it turn? Yeah, it has water. Exactly. It turns water is flowing all the time, right? You need something to flow that's going to keep hitting this wheel, make it turn at least a couple. You, something's going to have to hit it to make it turn at least a whole turn. Okay. What could that be? What would be one marble won't do? What if you had I think this is the all this happens? You had like somewhere a whole okay, tray of marbles uh, ready to go, and it only takes a marble to hit them to get them going, and then a bunch of marbles fall and hit. Them. What do you think? So you could use a bunch of marbles. Some people might would use sand, like you could pull some sand out of a. Let's say you had a two-liter bottle here, a two-liter bottle with sand. If somebody pulled the plug out of the bottle and the sand starts falling out of the bottle. It starts hitting the wheel like water, but it's sand. See, so it's going to turn it, right? That could work. Or marbles or something else. Because like you said, the water. Yeah, there you go. See, and when that falls out and that opens up, the sand starts falling out and makes the wheel turn. Is this, is this yours? Good. Good. So something like that. And all it's going to take to make that work is you're going to have to have something it's like this is like this and something's got to pull this out from under like that this is yours i think so all you got to do is have a string or something tied to it so when something falls it goes and the sand starts falling out on the paddle wheel okay there you go good deal like water and a string okay now the hard part for you is going to be how to figure how to rig that up that's going to be not easy you can do it. One end of it could be sticking in somewhere like your board. One end. But you're going to have to have something over here to hold the other end, right? One over there in the corner. And they got, they start right. They got the bell. You can ring the bell. It's 250. They got maybe two machines. That's 25. Uh, they got the sheet turning in time. That's 100. But it all happens in two seconds. A lot of you will remit yours will happen in about two seconds. That would be four points. But so we got to figure out how to slow your device down. So what I want to do after lunch is I want to show you, I've shown some of you pieces of timing devices, but I want to show you about three or four very simple timing <coughs> devices. A sand timer, a water timer, a balloon timer, a chemical reaction timer. I can show you three or four different timers that are easy to do. And you can add those in your device. And then for every second that timer goes, you get two points. So if that timer goes 55 seconds, 110 points. And then it does all the other stuff in two seconds, so there's two more, four more points, okay? So that's what we're going to do after lunch. And then, after we try learn how to delay these a little bit, we're going to talk about the size. I have to only talk about the size a little. I don't want you to exceed 60 because there is a 25-point penalty for each of the three dimensions that exceeds 60. So we don't want to exceed 60. But if you get smaller than 60 centimeters, for every dimension that's smaller, 
you get one more point for each centimeter smaller. And sometimes I've seen students come with their whole device as a box, but everything's over on this side of the box. They could have cut the box in half and gotten rid of that other half and moved the wall in and gotten a lot of points just for being smaller because there's a skinny, tall, and deep. 